everyone and welcome to this evening's webinar all about postgraduate study in the USA. My name is Holly Haig and I am one of our Education USA advisors at the US UK Fulbright Commission and I'll talk a little bit more about what those organisations are and what we do in just a moment. Um, tonight we are going to be covering a range of different topics from choosing a US university to putting together an application to finding funding. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Sarah, who's gonna briefly introduce herself as well. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Panik and I'm another Education USA advisor here at the Fulbright Commission. And as you might be able to tell from my accent, I am not originally from the UK. I'm originally from Chicago where I completed both my undergraduate degree and my master's degree. Though I've been living in London now for the past seven years and working at Fulbright for the past five years. So I'm delighted to be here presenting this webinar with you this evening. Great, thank you, Sarah. I should also add that as you can tell from my accent, I'm originally from here in the UK, um, but my connection to US study is that I did my undergraduate degree in the US. So can certainly, kind of vouch for that amazing experience that British students have when studying in the US. So before we dive right in, I just want to give a couple of housekeeping pieces for this session. Um, tonight's webinar will be recorded, so don't feel like you have to kind of frantically write down every single thing Sarah and I say, um, but if you do want to make notes, please go ahead. Um, and the other thing is that we will be having some time at the end of the session for question and answers. So we'd ask you to hold any questions that you have until then um, and po post them in the Q&A box at the end. So let's get started then. And just to introduce us, we're going to talk a little bit more about what Education USA is and what we do here at the US UK Fulbright Commission. So the US UK Fulbright Commission was founded um, over 70 years ago by Senator Fulbright, a US Senator, um, in the aftermath of World War II. And so he believed that to avoid a third world war from happening, the best um, way to do this was to promote peace and intercultural understanding through educational exchange. And so that's exactly what we aim to do here at the US UK Fulbright Commission. Um, and now there are a couple of different kind of sections of our organization. Um, and there are a couple of ways in which we do this. The one that many of you will be familiar with is through the Fulbright Postgraduate Awards, which are scholarships for postgraduate study in the USA for British citizens, which Sarah will talk a little bit more about later in the presentation. But the kind of section of the organization that Sarah and I represent are through our Education USA advisory services. So we offer free, up to date, non biased advice to help students in the UK to apply to US universities. And we form part of a global network of advisors who are in their countries doing the same thing to help students from their area to go and study in the USA. So if it is your dream to go and study in America, um, that is something that we are here to help you out with. So to start us off then, why might um, you consider studying in the US? You know, there are a lot of really great options here in the UK, but what are some of the key factors that kind of encourage British students to study in the US each and every year? Up on screen, I've got a list of just six of the kind of most common reasons that we see British students heading to the US. You may well have your own to add to this list, it's by no means exhaustive, but I just want to run through some of those top reasons. First and foremost, we have a real wide range of choices um, and a lot of rep repu reputable universities in the US to choose from as well. So here in the UK, whereas we have about 120 universities, in the US there's actually more than 1,700 universities offering postgraduate programmes, be that masters or PhDs. Um, and so there's that real sense of variety and choice. It really enables you to tailor your experience to whatever it is that you would like to get out of your US study experience. Um, within that, there's also, you'll also find that there is a real variety amongst different departments, not just institutions. And so you can really kind of hone in on whatever it is that you'd like to study. Next up is this idea of internationalizing your CV. Employers often cite cross-cultural understanding and experience as a really attractive quality in their applicants. And it's really helpful to have that kind of diversity of experience um, and that ability to kind of think independently um, 
is, is something that's really kind of valuable for employers and is really demonstrated through studying abroad. In a similar vein is this idea of global networking. So whilst you're in the US, um, US institutions can offer an unparalleled opportunity to really build global networks, not just with Americans, be it students or staff, but you're also likely to be surrounded by other you know, peers and academics from across the globe. Um, and so it really helps in terms of building out those global connections. Next up is practical experience. So there's a lot of opportunities for hands-on research, internship opportunities and teaching experiences as well as part of postgraduate programs in the US. And whilst you're on campus, you will actually, as a student, um, an international student, be eligible on your visa to work up to 20 hours a week during term time and up to 40 hours a week during break. So there's really great opportunities there to get that hands on experience and to kind of get that kind of work experience as well. Next up again, we've got this idea of expanding your horizons living and studying in another country, as I can certainly vouch for from personal experience, and I know Sarah can too, really expands your worldview and may expand the opportunities that are on offer to you in the future. And then last up, but certainly not least, we have got funding opportunities. Um, Sarah is going to talk a lot more in depth about this later in tonight's presentation, but this might be a, su a surprise to some of you, but there are um, a real plethora of funding opportunities available at US institutions. The key to this is to really be flexible and open-minded about where it is that you will apply. Um, but I just wanna highlight here that um, it is absolutely possible to have an affordable educational experience at the postgrad level in the US. Um, and we'll talk more about this as we go through. All right, so before I move on, on to some of our content tonight, I first want to highlight some of the key differences between postgraduate programs in the UK versus in the USA. The first thing has to do with the length of programs. So typically you're going to be doing a longer program if you're studying in the US. So whereas you'd usually be doing a kind of one year for a master's program that looks more like two years in the USA. And here in the UK, whereas um, you may be spending somewhere between kind of three and five years on a PhD, you're looking again slightly longer at a four to six year program in the USA. Again, this is not a hard and fast rule. You will find that there are some programs that are slightly shorter, slightly longer. It really does depend on the department and on the university itself. If you are looking to do a PhD in the US, another key difference is that most PhDs will involve an integrated master's, which means that for your first year or two, um, it will have a very coursework based focus um, and it gives you a chance, um, even perhaps if you already hold a master's degree, for instance, to really sharpen your skills and hone in on a particular skill set that may help you later down the line with your research endeavours. Um, you may also have an opportunity here to teach or conduct research within your faculty. Um, and again, that kind of integrated master's component of a PhD is not usually an optional, optional part. It's usually required. In the US as well, there's not usually um, kind of pure um, research degree offered. Usually most programs will include course, coursework as part of the postgraduate level. Another key thing, which again, we'll talk more about in depth, is that there are no set fees or deadlines across US universities. Unlike here in the UK, where we've got a very set standard uh, through the kind of UCAS application system and government um, kind of set the fees to be quite standardized across the board, you're going to see a great variance across US universities and between departments within particular universities. So definitely keep this in mind as you're going into the process. Um, Another key thing is that postgraduate programs often are led by the department as a whole and not by a particular supervisor. What this means is that you don't necessarily need to have a supervisor lined up beforehand. Um, and since programs are kind of more interdisciplinary in the US, it may well be that you are working with a panel of supervisors or perhaps supervisors from different departments. Um, and so you, you also with this same kind of philosophy in mind, 
don't normally need to have an in-depth research proposal in the same way as you would when you're applying to a UK program. They expect that through the kind of longer length of your program, you'll figure this out throughout your course. And then last but not least, um, if you are interested in the fields of law or medicine, these are courses that are only offered at the postgraduate level in the USA. And if you have questions on those, happy to take them at the end. All right, very briefly, let's talk about a quick timeline, um, suggested timeline that we have here at Education USA on the kind of key steps throughout the process. Note that we recommend that this whole process start to finish should realistically take you somewhere between 12 to 18 months. First up, we have got this idea of researching universities. And we recommend that you begin this process as early as possible, but minimum 12 months before you plan to enroll and head to a US university. As I'll talk about, it's probably the most important part of the process with there being so many options out there. Moving into um, kind of the autumn time before you would plan to enroll, so about 10 to 12 months before you plan to head to the US, is when you'll finalize a selection of around four to six universities that you ultimately will apply for. You'll then take any required exams for those universities and in that same autumn period put together and submit an application to the universities that you'd like to apply to. Moving into the springtime, um, say about six months or so um, before you plan to head to the US is when you'll start to receive admissions decisions back from the universities and you'll notify the university that you plan to enroll at that you'll be heading their way in the autumn. About one to three months before you plan to head to the US is when you'll apply for your US student visa at the US Embassy here in the UK. Um, and then in that similar sort of summertime period is when you head to our website, you can register for one of our pre-departure orientations and also get a lot of really great resources, information on our website with practical tips on moving to the US. And then finally, you will head to the US to begin your studies. Typically, uh, US universities will have a slightly short, uh, slightly earlier start date than many UK programs. So you're normally looking kind of late August, early September. All right, so I'm now gonna talk a little bit more in depth about choosing a program. So as I mentioned earlier, there are over 1,700 institutions offering postgraduate programs in the US. So with that in mind, there's lots of choice and each department is very different to one another. So how do you go about narrowing down where it is that you want to apply? Here at Education USA, we focus a lot on this idea of fit. Now, what fit means is we want for students to really find programs that are the best fit for you both personally, academically, and even professionally, and vice versa, that that university um, kind of offers you what it is that you are looking for. Um, and so, you know, fit is going to look slightly differently for each and every one of you. But the key to it is to really locate factors that are most important to you in picking out a program in the US. It's really important then that you are um, being flexible about what types of institutions that you're looking at in determining your fit. So you're not just going to look at, you know, universities that you've heard of straight away or that you've seen mentioned in Legally Blonde or in other films and TV shows, but you're instead going to kind of prioritise what is it that's most important to you to get out of your US study experience. Now up on screen, um, again, not an exhaustive list here, but I've got a couple of some of the top factors that students might want to consider in this idea of fit. So we've got types of institutions with there being so many, there's a lot of variety. Do you want to be in a private kind of very research focused organization? Do you want to be at a public university? Uh, do you want it to be at a small institution with a really close knit faculty and um, that kind of thing? Similarly, thinking about program type as we spoke about earlier on in the presentation program um, your program is very important in the experience that you're going to get at the postgraduate level so thinking about your career goals any qualifications or concentrations that you might want to focus in on while you're at a US university 
do you want to be in a program that's got funded internship opportunities or that you'll get grant writing experience what what is your priority when it comes to the program type and again with the academic department you know a lot of your experience is going to be determined by the department rather than a particular supervisor so having a look what types of work are, are the program really um, putting forward what is what is important to the department at the moment what kind of research are they focusing in on um, at the postgraduate level the academic department generally handles admissions designs the course and also monitors your progression throughout the program so it's really essential to find that right academic home um, you know departments are going to really vary quite drastically between um, faculty experience whether they're very tightly focused or if they're quite interdisciplinary in nature and um, their size and atmosphere are they collaborative are they competitive and also in terms of things like opportunities for teaching and research and and what the kind of funding looks like for things like going to conferences or pursuing internships so really really key is that academic department because there is just so much variety out there Location is another factor that's often uh, important for students, you know, are you looking to be somewhere uh, that's more urban or more rural or somewhere in between? Are you looking um, at somewhere that's got really good access to transportation links? Um, will you need a car to get around or will it be quite campus focused? Is uh, climate very important to you? You know, do you really not like um, sunny weather because you burn easily or do you really not like the cold? Um, that might, you know, the US is a huge country spanning six different time zones with every single climate you could imagine. So that could be an important consideration for you. Another thing here is this idea of um, extracurricular activities. Often US universities have a lot of opportunities to get involved outside of the classroom too. So you might want to be looking at uh, particular offerings in certain locations in that regard. And then as well, um, this idea of are there any particular areas or centers of excellence for the field that you are looking to study? So if you are interested in healthcare, might Boston be a really good place for you? If you're a political science major, might um, Washington DC and universities around that area offer really um, great programs for what you're interested in pursuing. And then finally, again, we're going to talk more about finances, but it's, if funding is a consideration for you, it is so, so important to be considering it as part of your fit right from the very beginning of the process. Unlike here in the UK, um, funding and applying for funding often takes place at the same time as when you're applying for admission, if not sometimes even before you've applied for admission at particular US universities, rather than here in the UK where it's a bit of an afterthought and comes much later in the process. So we really encourage you to think about this right from the get go um, to avoid being disappointed later down the line. OK, so with all of those factors in mind and with there being a lot to consider, how might you go about kind of narrowing down those options further? A really great resource here is actually our website. So on our website, we have got a whole guide to choosing a US university with lots of helpful links and resources to help you narrow down those options further. Um, and on the next slide, I'm actually going to walk you through a bit of an example of one of these search engines called Peterson's. Um, so this is again, one of those links that we post point to on our website. And it's particularly helpful because it helps you to decide and rank which factors are most important to you in choosing a university. So in this example, I am looking for programs in anthropology. Um, and if I click through to the next slide, I can see that we have um, pulled up a smaller amount of universities um, to choose from. And along the side here, we can see that we can narrow down even further by whether we're looking for a master's program or a doctoral program. We can also narrow down by the school size. So by students, there's an option to narrow down to location in particular states as well as what types of tuition uh, are available. So how much is the cost of attendance at that university? And then what's really great here is that you get this sort of 
snapshot su summary of the different um, departments that come up on offer in the US. You can click on these green buttons to get uh, at a glance overview of the kind of offerings of the anthropology department in this case. There's usually links off to the individual university's website, which is where I'd highly encourage all of you to be doing your research. Okay, so once you have kind of used some of those resources on our website, um, your initial goal is to narrow down your choices to about 10 to 15 universities of interest that you'll then go away and really hone in on that research. So going through the pages on their website, uh, reaching out directly to the universities, things like that is where you'll then do that ultimate kind of in-depth research with the goal to narrow it down further to somewhere between four to six universities that you'll ultimately submit an application. So there's a couple of main areas that I would suggest to, to research. First and foremost is on the university websites themselves. So you can really get a lot of information about the faculty members. Um, some faculty will even list their CVs, their research interests, a list of their publications. So it's a great way to get to grips with, okay, what types of things, where is, would I be studying? Where is the focus of the department? Often you'll also find the faculty's uh, contact information. And so you can reach out directly to specific professors if you want to kind of find out if they're still working or if you know are they going to be on sabbatical leave when you can study in the US for example. Another really great resource as you're doing your university research is actually current grad school students themselves. Um, grad school students can provide a really great insight into that student experience and what it's like to really study at a particular university that you're interested in. You can ask them things about what kind of projects they're working on, how close are the relationships with other students and with other professors, um, you know, what's the campus culture like? And you can also ask them, you know, more uh, practical questions like where can I find the best apartment? Uh, what's the local area like? What's the cost of living expected to be? Um, usually the departments at particular universities will be able to put you in touch with grad schools. Um, but note here that often the grad schools are going to pick students who have quite a positive experience of studying there. And so you might just want to take that kind of viewpoint with a pinch of salt. Other resources for university research, I'd suggest, you know, um, if you're wondering where might be a good place to start, leverage any contacts that you've got at your current UK university or your previous university if you've already graduated and you might want to have a look um, you know are any other professors that you are still in touch with do they have any networks in the US or any suggestions on where could be a good fit for you based on their experience and also a really good um, resource is to think about work that you have studied as part of an undergraduate degree or a master's degree where is that work being published? Who is producing it? Where are they working out from? Um, and from there, kind of looking, OK, where are their colleagues? What topics am I particularly interested in? And that can really help to inform where it is that you are looking in the US as well. All right, um, that's enough from me for the moment. I'm now going to hand over to my colleague, Sarah, who's going to talk a little bit more about putting together a US application and also funding your studies. Thank you, Holly. So Holly's just talked to you about some of the main reasons why students choose to go to the US for their postgraduate studies and how to go about choosing from the thousands of universities that are on offer. Um, and doing that research that Holly has talked about and choosing the universities where you want to apply is so important. Uh, not just be not just because of you know it's going to help you choose where to apply, but also because it's going to help you put together the strongest application possible um, and putting together that strong application not only for admission but also for any funding that you might want to attend if you're planning to apply for any funding. So in this next section, I'm gonna talk about the different components of the application and how to put together um, the strongest application possible. 
So first and foremost, um, what U.S. universities are going to be looking for in your application is going to be your academics. And that's going to be measured um, first by your degree results, so your undergraduate degree, and if you have a postgraduate degree, your postgraduate degree results as well. Um, and if required, maybe also an admissions exam and your admissions exam results, which we'll talk about in a little bit more. Um, and that'll be the kind of first thing that they're looking for. And you'll be able to kind of look on university websites to get a sense of what a typical applicant profile is and see how it is that you can compare to um, typical applicants at that university. They're also gonna be looking for an academic fit. So again, that comes back to the research. You're gonna be doing a lot of research on the institution, on the departments, on the specific program. And you're gonna be wanting to make sure that throughout your application, you're really able to uh, explain why this particular program is a good fit for you and why you're going to be a good fit for that program. So that's going to be something that you really want to come through in your application. You'll also need to have any kind of relevant preparation. So this is really going to, to vary depending on what program it is that you're applying for. So for instance, if you're applying for an MBA program, it might be that they require some type of work experience before you apply. If you're applying in um, something like physical therapy. Uh, it might be that there's a lot of different science prerequisites that, that are required. And so depending on what it is that you're applying, there's going to be different relevant preparation. Um, and so that's going to depend on what it is you're applying for and where it is that you're applying. So just make sure that you're looking at those university websites and understanding what it is that they require as part of your application. And then also, U.S. universities are going to be looking at your extracurricular involvement. Uh, a U.S. university application is very holistic. They're looking, for, most importantly, at your academics, but also you as a person. And they're trying to um, put together a program of students that they're going to bring their different experiences to their program um, and, and, you know, um, be able to provide the kind of best educational experience through that. And so they'll be looking at the different extracurriculars that you've been involved with throughout your time um, at university or if you're beyond university, uh, other ways that you spend your time outside of the classroom and outside of work. And so on this page here, you can see some of the different application components and I'll go through them briefly and then I'll go in some of the, into some of these in a bit more depth in the following slides. So first off, you'll have your application form, which is going to be your basic demographic information that you'll fill out. Um, you're also going to have any admissions exam scores. Again, I'll talk about that in a little bit more in a bit. Um, there'll also be a transcript. So what that's going to be is your degree results that will usually be sent from your, your university, your, your current institution or the institution that you attended, and also a personal statement, so, so an essay. They'll also usually ask for two to three recommendation letters. And, and this is going, again, going to vary by program. It might be that they ask for one from a professional reference and one from an academic reference. So you'll just want to make sure that you're reading those requirements closely. They'll also likely ask for a CV or a resume detailing any kind of work or volunteer experience. And then depending on the program, again, it might be that they ask for something like an interview, especially if you're maybe applying for an MBA program or an audition if you're applying for perhaps a, a theater program or a music program, or perhaps there might even be a submission of work. So for instance, an art portfolio, if you're applying for something in the, the field of art, or even maybe a writing sample. Uh, if you're applying in a research field or a social science field, they might ask for something like a writing sample. And there will typically be an application fee um, for each institution that you apply to of $50 to $100. And something to keep in mind uh, with these applications is that there is unfortunately no centralized system um, for applying to lots of universities at once. And so each university that you will apply to is going to have a different application. So you'll just want to make sure that you're paying attention to all the different required components, all the different deadlines. Um, the good news is, is that oftentimes there, there are things that might be similar. So it might be that you are able to reuse some of the components. You know, your, your CV may be fairly similar across the, the different uh, institutions where you're applying. You may be able to reuse parts of your essays. Um, you know, recommendations may be fairly similar from your referees. And so that's just something to keep in mind as you're applying. And going into the application components in a little bit more depth, 
as I've mentioned already, your academic profile is going to be kind of the, the most important part of your application, the first thing that an institution is looking at. And that's going to be made up again of your grades from your undergraduate degree. Um, and as well, if you've got postgraduate degree, they'll be looking at that as well. And you'll be able to have your university send a transcript. So you'll be able to ask for that from your, usually from your the university itself, from the registrar's office, or maybe from the department. And then again, test scores, if, if the institution where you're applying requires an admissions exam, you'll be sending test scores as part of your application. Uh, it might be that you are incorporating into your application somehow research that you've done at the undergraduate level, perhaps as part of an undergraduate dissertation. Um, and that, again, this is going to vary depending on what program that you're applying to. And as well as any kind of work experience that may be included um, that's relevant to your, your field of interest. And last here on the screen, you see something that we call the, the X factor, um, not the television show, as you might imagine, but it actually re is referring to something that might make you unique. So you'll want to have a think about, you might not even realize it's something that makes you unique, um, but have a think about something that you have that perhaps they won't be seen in any other applicants. I mean, it could, depending on where you're applying, it could just be the fact that you are applying as a student from, from the UK. Um, if you, you know, there are going to be many institutions in the US that might not have any students have, who've applied from the UK before. So if you're doing research on um, and being really flexible in where you apply, it might be that you're the only student applying from the UK. Or it might be that you've had a really unique undergraduate experience and that you're able to talk about that throughout your application. And so again, the US universities are looking to build a diverse group, um, diverse cohorts of students that will be completing their programs. And so if there's anything that you feel like you can bring that's going to be unique to the program, you'll want to make sure that you include that somewhere in your application. All right, so now to talk a little bit in a little bit more detail about admissions exams and standardized tests. So just first off to say that there's no kind of national curriculum in the US. And so that's where this idea of admissions exams and standardized tests came from. It kind of just helps level the playing field a little bit so that everybody who is applying to a particular program is taking um, the same type of exam. That being said, uh, not all programs are going to require an admissions exam. And so if that's something that you're not interested in, you can do your research and see if you can find one that doesn't require it. And especially with COVID this past couple of years, there are certain programs that have uh, loosened the requirements or have maybe gotten rid of the requirements altogether. However, there are many institutions that are still requiring the exam. And so I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about what they are. So you can see some of the different tests that are up here on screen. Um, the GRE is an exam that's typically required for um, graduate programs, a lot, a lot of times in like maybe the social sciences. You're gonna see the GMAT mentioned if you are applying for an MBA. The MCAT is for medical degrees. Um, and you may even have heard of the LSAT before, that's typically for law degrees, although not required for um, an LLM in which you would only need a uh, first degree in law. Um, but typically these exams are going to be multiple choice exams uh, and they will be under time conditions and they're gonna be testing you in areas of kind of verbal and quantitative reasoning. And there may even be a writing section. Uh, if you go onto our website, you can find more details about what, these, what the exams entail in more detail and kind of when they're offered. Something that's been really interesting during COVID times is that both the GRE and the GMAT, for instance, have made it possible for you to test not only at a testing center, but you may be able to test from the comfort of your own home. So if that's something that you would prefer to do, uh, that's an option for you to be able to do. Um, what we would definitely recommend, though, before you sit any of these exams, is going online and finding a free practice test. Typically, the exams themselves even offer free um, practice tests from their website and taking that practice exam under time conditions. And that will really give you a sense of what it's like to take the exam and how to best kind of prepare and revise for it. And we do really recommend if this is something that's required for your applications that you do prepare for it in advance and spend time to kind of focus on it and figure out where you might need to study the most. And there's a lot of uh, 
different resources that are available. You can buy study test prep books. You can use online resources. So there are a lot of uh, test prep materials that are available for you to use. Um, so yeah, be sure to check out our website and find out more information about that. So next we've got the personal statements. And this is something that can really help set your application apart. So especially if you are applying to a very competitive university where everybody who's applying has you know, top, top grades and top test scores, uh, a personal statement is something that can really help set you apart from the other people who are applying. And something that's important to note here is, is that it's not, it's not gonna be like your UCAS personal statement that you did for your undergraduate degree, and it's not an in-depth uh, research pro proposal. It really gives you the opportunity to share a little bit about yourself alongside your interests in applying for that particular program. It's very likely that the institution where you're applying is going to have specific questions that they want you to answer. And so in your research, you'll be able to take a look at what those questions are and start thinking about how you might answer those questions. And you'll see very quickly from looking at the questions on these websites that they're going to be questions that really kind of delve into getting to know a little bit more about who you are, um, why you're interested in, in the institution, why you're interested in the program, and how you think it might help you in your um, professional and career aspirations. And so you'll want to really um, use all that time that you've spent researching that ha Holly talked about earlier in the presentation to really kind of demonstrate that you've done research on the institution, on the department, on the program, and kind of incorporate that research into your, your statements of why you're a good fit for the university, um, while also being able to share something about yourself. Again, there's more information on our website about this, including lots of examples of different personal statements. And so I'd highly recommend that you check this out um, for more information on how to kind of put that together. Another thing that you'll just want to be sure of in terms of writing tips, first, make sure that you answer the question fully, um, but also make sure that you're checking over the essay for any kind of punctuation, spelling, grammar, have other people read your essay for you, get, get feedback. Um, and again, we've got more information um, on our website and I can see that Holly has just linked to that fulbright.org.uk. So now to go into a little bit more depth about the letters of recommendation. So as I mentioned earlier, the you'll usually be asked to submit kind of two to three letters of recommendation. Uh, it might be that you're asked to do one from an academic referee, maybe another from a professional referee. What's going to be really important is that you're choosing people who know you well, ideally both inside and outside of the classroom. You'll want to sit down with them in advance and let them know where it is that you're applying, why it is that you're applying to the US, what the programs are, give them some information. And you'll probably also want to share with them some of the information that you're hoping they will include in their letter. Um, if for any reason the university asks you to waive your right to view the letters of recommendation, we do typically recommend that you do waive your right to see the letters. That's because it just means that the, the letters will have more validity in the eyes of the admissions officer who's reading it. So they'll know that if the person who wrote the letter hasn't shown it to you, then they'll, it kind of just makes it um, more valid and it makes it makes it more credible. Um, but that being said, you can uh, talk to your referee about what it is that you hope that they're going to address in the letter. Um, and these again can be used as a marketing tool for you as an applicant. And so if there's anything that you, you know, maybe something that you do that you've done really well in the classroom, maybe some research that you've done really well, or in the professional world, if there's a way that you've been really successful and you want that to be highlighted to the admissions person who's reading the letter, then make sure that you mention that to the person who's writing your letter so that they can include that. And another thing that I just want to make sure that I say here is that you'll want to encourage your referees to be really enthusiastic in their language. Uh, as you might imagine, uh, these letters are going to be read alongside a lot of um, your American counterparts. And in the US, people are very enthusiastic with their language, very positive, um, very descriptive. And so this is not going to be the time for any modesty or reserve. 
make sure that anybody who you are asking to write the letter that they are aware that you're applying to a U.S. university and encourage them to be very, very enthusiastic in their language. All right. So now that we've talked about the application and the different components of the application, I'd like to talk in more depth about funding your studies. And as you might imagine, this is one of the top things that we get asked about. And one of the most common misconceptions is that the U.S. is always going to be more expensive because of the high fees that are associated with these U.S. universities. But the good news is that that isn't always the case. There's actually a significant amount of funding that's available at the postgraduate level, and particularly if you're willing to be flexible and go into the process with an open mind and do your research on all the different funding that's available. So there are four main sources of funding um, in the U.S. The first is actually just personal family funds. So there is very much in the U.S. a culture of saving and paying for university in a way that we don't have in the same way here in the UK with the loan-based system here. Um, there is typically an expectation that you will make a contribution to your studies. But that being said, um, another really big source of funding in the US is US universities itself. And that actually tends to be the best resource for funding. Um, there's two most common types of funding at the postgraduate level. So one is in the form of fellowships which are outright grants that allow a recipient to focus solely on their own work. There's also something called assistantships, and these are offered in return for services provided to the department. So something like teaching, research, lab supervision, maybe working in a campus office in exchange for a fee waiver, um, or maybe health insurance or a stipend. And assistantships are typically renewable from year to year if the student maintains specified academic standards. Although the terms of an assistantship will vary dramatically um, between different universities and departments. And uh, it'll also depend on like what kinds of grants are available, the field and the department need. So it is, if this is the kind of funding that you're looking for, it is always going to be really important to ask the department or program about this kind of funding when you're choosing where to apply. More funding does generally tend to be available for PhDs and students in research focused masters than for professional degree students. Um, and it also varies by subject area. So for instance, the sciences tend to receive more funding than programs in the humanities. It doesn't mean that funding in those other areas is impossible. It just might not be quite as common. You might have to do a little bit more research and be a little bit more flexible in where you apply. And you'll want to make sure that you check uh, with multiple offices about funding opportunities. You're gonna hear me say this a few different times so that I can really get make sure that you remember it. You'll want to make sure that you're checking with the department where you're applying, um, the graduate school, if the university has a graduate school, as well as the financial aid office. Um, and you'll want to check all three of those locations at a university, just because it might be that they don't have the same information in one centralized location, and you might actually find that there is different funding available from each of those different places. In addition to funding from U.S. universities, you may also seek funding from external funding bodies. So um, these are basically like niche scholarships, so institutions that are separate to universities that are companies, charities, foundations that provide funding for postgraduate study. And the last option that we have here on the screen is loans. Now this we talk about as kind of a last resort option, and the reason for that is because you um, can't take you can't take like a UK student loan to the US and most US lenders will require a US citizen to co-sign on a US student loan. Um, and so therefore, if a UK citizen decides to take out a loan, it's typically a private loan from a UK bank. Uh, and those tend to have very um, high interest rates and very strict payback terms, which may require you to pay back your loan, start paying back your loan before you've even completed your studies, before you're even earning any money, which is not very practical. And so loans really should be used as a last resort. That being said, if you are an American citizen or like a dual U.S. citizen, um, you, can, you can still take out a loan from a U.S. lender and you'll be able to apply for U.S. federal loans through something called FAFSA. So as you can see from these different sources of funding, university and external funding are the preferred options since they don't have to be paid back. So now I'll talk a little bit about um, a funding strategy that you might. So 
there's some different ways that you may approach funding to kind of make it more affordable for you to pursue your studies in the US. So you can think of a few different approaches. So one thing that you might consider is reducing the cost of living. As you might imagine, it's typically cheaper to live in a rural area versus an urban area. So just as in the UK, it's going to be more expensive to go to a university in London. Um, in the US, it's gonna be more expensive to go to university in New York City. So that's just something to consider when you're choosing the location of where you want to apply. You may also look to lower your tuition costs. So in the US, um, public universities are state-funded universities. So within, this, within different states, um, they're public universities that receive funding from the state, and they generally have lower tuition costs than private universities. That being said, private universities do sometimes have more funding available, um, but it all just kind of depends, but it is something to consider. And lastly, as we've already mentioned, you can look for university funding. Um, so in addition to looking for funding from the university in the ways that we've talked about, you may also wish to consider maybe an interdisciplinary approach. So for example, let's say you're an architecture student in the architecture program, but you have an interest in environmental architecture and building sustainable buildings. It might be that you go to the environmental science program at that institution and see if they have any funding for you to help with your degree. Um, so thinking creatively. And just a word of caution here that you might not necessarily be able to use all of these strategies in one go. Like I said, you might find that universities with lower tuition might have fewer funding opportunities, so you might not be able to um, employ both of those strategies at once. Um, but these are just some different ways to kind of lower costs and um, make it more affordable for you to go to the US. So um, just as an example here, I just want to compare two different programs within Boston. So Boston University's cost of attendance within the Department of Education and Human Development is over $79,000 with tuition, room and board and other fees. If you compare that to an MA at the University of Massachusetts, Boston, um, all of that would be about $25,000 less. So as you can see, we've got two universities in the same city, um, great variance in tuition and great variance in fees. So it's about kind of being open-minded and where you choose to apply. And something to keep in mind here is that sometimes universities in the same city have links and relationships with each other. So, so for instance, you might even be able to take classes at Boston University while being at UMass. And so it's worth looking into if you can find a program in a place where you want to be that has lower tuition, but you may still be able to take classes at a nearby university whose tuition is higher, that's something to consider. So now I just want to take a little look at a few examples of how to identify funding opportunities. And as I already mentioned, for university funding, the best resource is going to be the university website, checking those three different places, the department page, the graduate school page, and the financial aid pages. Um, making sure that you check all three in case not all the funding opportunities are advertised centrally. You'll want to see what they say, if they have much funding available. Um, universities do generally try to give you an accurate but conservative measure of how much funding they offer. And if the information isn't available online, it might suggest that they can't offer a lot of financial support, but it is worth getting in touch with the departmental administrator or the director just to double check. You'll also want to think about whether you're going to be competitive for funding at that particular institution where you're applying. You can ask to speak with current students, um, maybe see how competitive funding really is, if they have an assistantship, what it involves, what their work-life balance is, and kind of find out more information from the students themselves. You might want to find out how many assistantships there are available, whether they're full or partial, um, and find out maybe on what basis they award assistantships. Is your GRE score from that admissions exam factored into it, or is it going to be more on the basis of your other academics or maybe prior experience? And you'll also want to find out if there's any extra requirements that you need to fulfill to be considered for an assistantship. You might automatically be considered just by applying, but in some cases you might need to submit an additional essay or another resume. So now we're going to see an example on a university website of what you can look out for. So. 
This is the website of the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, which is a top public research university. And we've highlighted some key points in their section about fellowships and assistantships and how to identify when a university has funding available. So as you can see on this page, most universities who are generous with funding will make it really obvious on their websites. So in the Department of Political Science, they note that most students in their department are supported by fellowships and assistantships. They also explain that duties typically range from 10 to 15 hours per week, and they list the type of duties that you can expect. It also mentions eligibility for a variety of fellowships and notes that Chapel Hill, where the university is located, has a low cost of living. So you can see here that two points of the funding strategy exist, both university funding and the lower cost of living. And then here we have an example of a scholarship from an external funding body, so the Fulbright Awards. Um, so as Holly mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, the Fulbright Commission is funded by UK and US governments with a mission of promoting mutual understanding through educational exchange. And so there's funding available for UK students to study and conduct research in the US and vice versa at the postgraduate level. Now, the number of awards fluctuates for this each year with a deadline in early November. Um, and so the next applications, you know, the next application cycle will be for, you'll have to apply in November of 2022 in order to start uh, your studies in the autumn of 2023. Um, and so there are a variety of awards available. Uh, some are gonna be for the first year only, other partner awards might be fully funded. So you'll want to go on the Fulbright website to check for more details. Um, also on our website, we have more resources for exploring different external funding scholarships. So we have online scholarship search engines and that can help you kind of narrow down thousands of scholarships that are available based on different factors such as your country of origin, your field, um, and it can allow you to find out more information about the eligibility. And then you'll want to refer to the funding bodies website for more information about the application process and deadlines. So just some more funding tips um, as I wrap up this section. Uh, as we've mentioned a couple of times already, the application for funding happens simultaneous to the admissions process, maybe even sometimes before. Um, and so it's really important to begin searching for funding early and incorporating this into your choosing process from the very beginning. So funding is, is important to you. Make sure that you are searching for funding alongside the programs where you want to apply. It'll be really important for you to put in the time and effort to, to seek out and apply for these funding opportunities. Um, typically, scholarships will not find you, and so you'll need to find them, and you'll need to investigate university funding, take the time to search for the often niche external scholarships. And you'll also want to make sure that you're flexible in choosing universities. If it's essential for you to receive funding to complete your postgraduate study, you'll want to choose departments and institutions where there's a lot of funding and where you're competitive students. Um, sometimes you'll be able to look on the university websites to see if they've got any scores or grades from last year's admitted students to compare yourself. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, as a student applying from the UK, if you are applying to an institution where they get loads of UK applicants, it might just make it that much more competitive for the admission and for the funding. But if you are applying to an institution where maybe they don't have many British students applying, it could be that you have a higher chance of both admission and funding. And again, I know I've said this before, but I'll say it again to make sure that you've really got it. For university funding, you'll want to check those three different places on the website, uh, the university website, the department, the graduate school, and the financial aid pages. Check all three, just in case not all the funding opportunities are advertised centrally. And then a final note here of just something to keep in mind is that on your student visa uh, in the US, you can typically work on campus for up to 20 hours per week during term time and 40 hours per week during holidays. Although the earnings that you get from that um, can't be calculated for visa purposes when you're showing your proof of funds, but it is just useful to know that you do have the ability to earn a little bit while you are in the US. And with that, I am going to hand back over to my colleague, Holly, who's going to talk to you about ways that we can help you going from here.
Thank you, Sarah. So yes, before we move into the Q&A section for tonight, I'm going to briefly outline some of the ways that you can stay in touch with us and use us as a resource as you go on with your next steps after this evening. So Sarah and I have both referenced this a lot and I've um, mentioned it in the chat earlier on, but our website is an excellent resource uh, for all things US study. So if you head to this going to the USA tab along the top, there is a section all about postgraduate study in the US with a guide broken down into several different areas, many of which we have talked about tonight, but with a lot of detail about um, the different kind of resources we've spoken about, different things to keep in mind as you're choosing a university, putting together your application and looking for funding as well. We also have an email address. Sarah, I might ask you to pop that in the chat, but you can get in touch with us with any questions via email. Um, we monitor that Monday to Friday and aim to get back to you as soon as possible. In addition, you can also book in a one-to-one -one Zoom appointment with um, me, Sarah, or our colleague Rowena, and ask any specific questions that you have there. We're more than happy to talk through any specific situations or circumstances that you may have. And then all of you who are here tonight are already doing a great job of kind of tuning into these sessions. But throughout the year, we have a range of different events all about studying at the postgraduate level in the US. At the moment, we are all virtual. Uh, but we hope that in the next year or so, we'll be able to resume some in-person sessions as well. All right, so that wraps up um, the kind of informational presentation style section of this session. I'd now like to open the floor to any questions that you have. Um, please do pop those in the Q&A box and Sarah and I will stick around for the next kind of few minutes, depending on how many questions that we have come through to help you out with those and stop sharing our slides. Just give everyone a couple of minutes. If you do want to ask a question, um, please put that in the Q&A box. And if you think of a question afterwards, then you can always email us or sign up for a call as well. Great. So I can see Sarah, a question in the chat and it says, thank you so much for the session. Um, for scholarships, can second year MBA students apply? Now, Joyce, it would be really helpful to have a little bit more information about your circumstances. Are you referring to the Fulbright Awards? Um, you know, whereabouts are you at the moment? That would be really helpful. So we can best give you the best information there for your question. But my, my kind of general answer, I suppose, will be that in terms of applying for scholarships, it will really vary according to each individual scholarship that you're applying to as to what their requirements are, whether or not you are able to apply. Um, you know, as an incoming student or whether you can kind of transfer partway through your degree. So it's really important to kind of do that research that we were talking about before in terms of identifying good fit, um, good fit scholarship programs. Oh, I can see here. So for the Fulbright Awards, for a prospective student hoping to start in 2022, Right, that is a really good question for our Fulbright Awards team. Um, so again, I think Sarah is going to put in the chat how you can get in touch with them. Um, I believe that it is just for incoming students um, for the first year of your study, um, but it will depend on the award that you're applying to. Um, and so, yes, definitely get in touch with our Fulbright Awards team who handle the kind of application materials for that. Um, Similarly, Holly, I think we had another question about um, Greek nationality and a Greek studying in the UK to eligible to apply for a Fulbright scholarship. So you'll want to double check that with the uh, Fulbright Awards team at programs at fulbright.org.uk as well. Yes, the um, typical line with, um, with that is that usually you do have to be a UK citizen in order to apply for the Fulbright Awards. The exception 
is if you so if you don't hold UK citizenship, usually the team will ask that you write to the commission in your home country. So in this case, if you get in touch with the Greek commission to see if you would be eligible to apply there first and foremost, if they come back and say that you wouldn't be. Um, that's when you would have a conversation with our Fulbright Awards team and they may uh, allow you to apply here in the UK. But just depends a little bit on the kind of individual circumstances of that. Because I know sometimes at some commissions you're unable to apply if you've lived out of the country and things like that. So it is really handled on a case by case basis. And as Sarah says, definitely reach out to our colleagues over on the Fulbright Awards team. We've got one question in the chat and then a couple of questions in the Q&A box. So just to, so it doesn't get lost here in the chat, we had a question about which universities do UK students typically not apply to, which is a good question. Um, and I think I'll, I'll start Holly. And then if you want to add anything, I think if, if you, if you can imagine that there are, there are a, few, a handful of universities that a lot of people in the UK have heard of that's, that are in the US. So if it's kind of one that's very familiar um, that you've heard of before, it's likely that they are getting British students, UK students applying to those institutions. Um, in terms of, um, it, you know, it's a tricky question. One answer that I would give about where students typically might not apply to is maybe some more like there's there's a lot of kind of like we had a colleague, for instance, who studied in the state of Wyoming, uh, which is like quite a unique place for a British student to go and study. And so if you you might want to consider some of the states that maybe aren't as familiar to, to people in the UK, and they might have some institutions that maybe haven't been considered by British students before. Uh, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Holly. Yeah, I think, you know, that is absolutely right what Sarah has just said. And we've spoken a lot in this presentation about that idea of being flexible and open minded. So I can say this because I am British, that we as Brits often when it comes to university choices can be quite snobby. So, you know, here in the UK, you might go, oh, well, I've only heard of this university and that university. So they must be the only ones worth applying to. Um, much in the same way if, if I was advising an American student coming to the UK, I would by absolutely no means say, well, you should only look at Oxford and Cambridge because they're the only good universities worth applying to. And so I think, yeah, having a, having a look at universities beyond those that you're familiar with or you've heard in pop culture is a really good start. As Sarah was saying, being flexible about where it is in the US. So I think a lot of British students often go, OK, well, I only want to study on either the east or the west coast. There is a whole load of country in the middle of that um, that is there to explore. So having a look into the Midwest or the south of the country as well. Um, to really kind of get to grips with what what the breadth of offerings that are out there in the US is kind of what I would suggest there. Okay, so I can see that we have got um, a question here about optional practical training. Um, so the question is, will the USA award OPT uh, for three years for those who do postgraduate studies in CSE? I'm not quite sure what CSE is, I have to admit, but or STEM courses. And could you talk a little bit more about this? So for those of you who don't know, um, optional practical training is um, sort of an extension of your student visa that you can apply for um, after you've completed your studies in the US. Um, and so for most programs, um, it allows for you to extend your stay in the US to work for up to one year um, after you have finished your program. And some students choose to take advantage of that. Um, but as, as um, this particular student has mentioned, um, for STEM programs, you are able to extend that and apply for OPT for up to three years. So that is the case if you were studying a computer science degree um, in the US. But again, for the most up-to-date information on that, I would always recommend referring to information from the US Embassy here in the UK and also connecting up with the International Student and Scholars Services at your US institution because they'll be able to provide the best information about what you would be eligible to apply for, um, how long that would be and what that would look like according to your degree programme. So that would be kind of our best advice on that. 
We also have a question here about housing at the postgraduate level, um, which is a good question. And so this is really going to depend on the, the institution itself. And so if you are looking, um, you know, you're going to need somewhere to live no matter where, what institution you go to. So you'll probably be having to think about what kind of housing would be your preference. Are you hoping to be able to stay on campus in some type of graduate housing provided by the university? Are you hoping to find an apartment on your own? Um, and it will it will vary. There will there will be institutions that provide housing options for graduate students. Um, some universities may even provide housing options for graduate students who have who, um, who have a partner or who have children, um, and so that might even be available. So if that's something that you are particularly looking for, that's something that you'll just want to incorporate into your research. And generally, you'll probably also just be looking at the cost of living as part of that you know, what the cost is going to be for you to go to the U.S. and what kind of funding you're going to need. So you will take a look at the website um, to take a look at, you know, it, it might be that going to find an apartment is going to be cheaper um, if you're sharing a room with, with, you know, sharing a flat with lots of people. It could be, you know, it, it is really going to vary. I'm not sure if there's anything you'd like to add to that, Holly. No, I think that was super comprehensive. Okay, so it looks like that is our last question um, that I can see coming through in the Q&A in the chat. But thank you all so much for attending this evening. And we really hope that the information we've shared has been helpful. If you do have any additional questions that come to mind, you know, as you're in the shower or you just think about something um, after this session, please do use the email address that we put in the chat, advising at fulbright.org.uk or book in a session to speak with me or Sarah. So thank you so much again and wishing you all a lovely rest of your evening. Take care. Bye. Bye.